I'd like to introduce um, to you Sister Sharon McMillan. Sister Sharon is a sister of Notre Dame. Um, I first met Sister Sharon um, at a Divine Worship Advisory Committee meeting. And she was introduced to us as a member of the committee. And when I heard her uh, background, I thought, how did we in this little diocese of Monterey get so lucky to get this gem in our diocese? And um, she has surely proven to be that. Sister, um, as I mentioned, she's a sister of Notre Dame. She has a doctorate in sacred liturgy from the Benedictine University in Rome. For 13 years, she taught at the um, seminary in Menlo Park, teaching liturgy to our seminarians. And then she sent, spent three semesters teaching liturgy in Nairobi, um, also to seminarians. She has now come back to the Diocese of Monterey where she is the liturgy coordinator at the cathedral in Monterey at San Carlos Cathedral. But she always reminds me that she got her humble beginnings <laughs> at Madonna del Sasso as the right. liturgy coordinator way back in 1977. So we are blessed tonight to have Sister Sharon with us to give us some information on practical insights into liturgical preparation. So Sister Sharon, we're all ears. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Peter. Thank you to everybody who came out tonight. Um, certainly in Monterey, it's a cold and windy, blustery night. So I'm really grateful for all of you to give your time and energy to be here. So I thought we might begin conscious that we are in the presence of the good God and pray. Let us pray in Advent time with longing and waiting for the coming of the Lord. Father in heaven, our hearts desire the warmth of your love and our minds are searching for the light of your word. Increase our longing for Christ our Savior and give us the strength to grow in love that the dawn of his coming may find us rejoicing in his presence and welcoming the light of his truth. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. So, this is a presentation about the general instruction of the Roman Missal. I'm often asked, is there a set of rubrics? Are there guidelines for how the Mass is to be celebrated? And the answer is a definitive yes. Well, where might you find such a document? <laughs> well, if you have the Roman Missal, it is literally the introduction, the first many pages of the Missal. Obviously, the title is the general instruction of the Roman Missal, and here it is. You may also find it in a separate edition published by the bishops of the United States. Very handy document. Let me just share a little bit about its history. The Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563, also, like Vatican II, recognized the need for some reforms to the liturgy. So rather than implementing those reforms itself as the work of the council, it gave over those decisions to the Pope, Pope St. Pius V, and some of the liturgical experts of the day. They wanted to impose some uniformity on a church that was blessed in many ways, but frustrated in many ways with all kinds of diversity as to how the Mass was celebrated. So in the year 1570, the Roman Missal was produced and imposed on every Catholic parish, every Catholic diocese in the world. And it had a general instruction. But those were mostly the words of rubrics. So when the Second Vatican Council came about, 
and it introduced its own new missile. It was committed to, yes, rubrics, but an introduction that would capture much of the profound liturgical theology that was in the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Much of that liturgical theology we heard so beautifully articulated, explained, and clarified by Bishop Ryan in his previous three talks. So in the general instruction itself, you'll find the same theology reiterated, encouraged, stressed, underscored, but then the, the teachers, the experts wanted to say, so if this theology is true, which it is, then what would it look like when we celebrate mass all over the world? Are there standards? Are there principles? How will the different parts of the mass be celebrated? So the first document was the sacramentary of 1970. And your eye was probably caught by the fact that 1970 is 400 years exactly from the previous Roman Missal, 400 years. So imagine, there are many of us um, here present who remember what the Missal of 1570 was like. But now we have the Missal of 1970 with its general instruction. 1975 was the second edition of the sacramentary and an updated general instruction. Why was it updated? What had happened? Well, the order of subdeacon was omitted and many of those roles given over to the acolyte and to the lector. So the new general instruction needed to reflect that. 1983 was the revised code of canon law that also had liturgical implications. And so, sure enough, in 2002, there was a third edition of the sacramentary in Latin, now called the Missal, and its updated general instruction of the Roman Missal. Now, I know it has kind of a funny anacronym, and we pronounce it germ. And you will remember that Bishop Ryan many times talked about the germ. This is what he's talking about, the general instruction of the Roman Missal. So the most recent one was published as the introduction to that new Missal that we have. But the general instruction was published separately in 2003, and so we already started implementing it in 2003. It was only Advent 2011 when we actually started with that new missal of which the germ is the introduction. There's also a companion document that I would encourage um, if you're interested, and that's the introduction to the lectionary which is also a beautiful document that is rooted in the profound theology of the word, but then moves on to, well, if that theology is true, what does it look like in our parish when we celebrate the liturgy of the word? So before we jump into some new things, I want to stress that when the most recent general instruction came out, the vast majority of its articles are things that are repeated and reinforced. And right there we see how some of the profound theology is enfleshed. Let me begin with just three theological elements that you will find taken from the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy and put right into the general instruction of the Roman Missal from as early as 1970 all the way up to now. These are elements that have not changed at all. And again, some of these will sound very familiar to you because these are the things that Bishop Ryan also underscored. So you'll find them again in this document. The first one is this extraordinary truth that Catholics believe and teach, that the reality of the sacrifice of the cross is here and now present in our celebration of the Mass. It's not something we primarily think about. This is not an intellectual exercise. 
We truly believe because of the divinity of Jesus Christ that his acts are acts of a member of the Trinity. His acts are divine. And so they are permanently present. So that sacrifice of the cross, Jesus' death and resurrection, is permanently present reality. Invisible, but absolutely real. How do we access it? Through our prayer, through the sacraments, but primarily, of course, and substantially in the celebration of the Eucharist, which is an encounter with Jesus' death and resurrection, which we like to call the Paschal Mystery. So the idea is not that somehow we get in a liturgical time machine and we go back 2,000 years. It's the other way around. It's that this divine act, the whole reality that is Jesus Christ, primarily his passion, death, and resurrection, is present now in the Diocese of Monterey in 2013. And we access it in a variety of ways as Catholics, but of course primarily, chiefly, in a way that is repeatable in the sacrifice of the Mass. What an extraordinary truth that the sacrifice of the cross is present and that we can participate in it, again, in this particular way through the Eucharist. The quote there in Numbers 2 and 16, it says, in the celebration of the Mass, the mysteries of redemption, so the Paschal mystery, are recalled so as in some way to be made present. They are present in in our midst. Number two, this document recalls the primary importance of full, conscious, and active participation by all the baptized in the celebration of the Eucharist. What gives us that right to participation, that duty of participation, our baptism. Our baptism, Vatican II, reminds us the authentic tradition of Catholicism about the meaning of baptism is that there are no silent spectators. We have a share in the priesthood of Jesus Christ through our baptism. And baptism gives us a right to participate, but also a duty to participate. And we'll see some of the challenges of that as we go along. So the church has always said that its primary goal in restoring the authentic tradition of the way to celebrate the sacraments, the church's goal is participation, full, conscious, and active in the offering of the Mass. We offer with the priest. It's not something we watch. It is something we offer, we celebrate, we acknowledge, we glorify. This is our participation. And then number three, the document will also remind us of this also, this tremendous truth that we heard in the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, that yes, there is a real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, and there are four, and they're all real. One is in the presence of the assembly itself, a real presence of Christ when the church gathers, a real presence of Christ in the proclamation of the word, a real presence of Christ in the person of the ordained minister, and a real presence of Christ that is substantial and permanent in the Eucharistic species, precious body, precious blood. So if that is you know, a quick distilled summary of some of the liturgical principles of theology in the Second Vatican Council, then what does it look like when Mass is celebrated? And are there any implications of this theology for what Mass will look like? So I want to offer you a few of these. Um, Many of these items, these articles that we're going to look at tonight are the same in all of those editions of the general instruction. So I want to look first at the ones that continue to be the same. 
So I would suggest to you this is liturgical law. This is the formal, authentic teaching of the Roman Catholic Church about how Mass is to be celebrated. That being said, let me just mention a couple of other points. Number one, the role of the diocesan bishop is key here. The church gives the bishop authority over many different aspects of how the mass is celebrated. So if you do take the time, and I hope you will, to read this document, or at least the parts that are of real interest to you, just note that the diocesan bishop has permission to change some of the things that are here. And secondly, is what I used to say to the seminarians, this document is not meant to hit people over the head. (laughs) This is a pastoral tool. This is not something that we judge each other against, criticize each other with. This is a pastoral tool. It's a goal, it is a vision, it is practical, um, but it's also meant to be pastoral. So as you read this and you're inspired and you say, oh, we're not doing that in our parish, what a wonderful opportunity then to catechize, to grow, to involve the parishioners and to move towards a vision that you would like to see, but not to criticize each other or Um, you know, to be judgmental with this wonderful document. Okay, a couple of things. The first one, I'm sorry I didn't number these, but this is the fourth in order on that paper. The unity of the assembly, profound theological point. We are members of the body of Christ. What does that mean for Sunday Mass? There is common posture. You may say, well, that's pretty obvious, common posture. The document will say, a common posture to be observed by all the participants is a sign of the unity of the members of the Christian community gathered for sacred liturgy. It both expresses and fosters the intention and spiritual attitude of the participants. What does this mean? Our unity as members of the body of Christ takes precedence over my individual likes, dislikes, and preferences. Number one, we all sing. So communion ministers processing in say, oh, you know, Sister Sharon, I don't, I don't sing. <laughs> well, the, the assembly sings. You take a copy of the hymnal in your hand and you mouth the words even if there may not be anything coming out because the common posture of the assembly is what, especially as a communion minister or as a lector, that's what we model. We stand. You know, you don't decide this Sunday I'm going to sit for the gospel because I feel like it. We all stand. We maintain silent prayer together. After the reading, you know, we enter into that, whether we feel like it or not. We process together to receive Holy Communion. Obviously, we're not elbowing each other out of the way. We are sensitive to the people in front of us, the people behind us. Um, We take care to respect the people around us. We also arrive early, and guess what? We stay until Mass is over. This is not a matter of, well, I've gotten what I came for, so I'm leaving now. That may be your preference. The document would suggest to you that your baptismal vows will challenge you here. You know, whether you feel like going to brunch early, the body of Christ needs you to be present and needs you to participate. Our presence and participation in Mass I would suggest is an act of liturgical surrender. Whether you like the priest, whether you appreciate the organist, whether the acolytes annoy you, whether the lector mumbles, whether the cantor is flat, 
This is about your commitment to this assembly, your presence, and your full participation. You surrender, I surrender, my personal preferences. Another example, the posture for the communion rite in the entire Roman Catholic Church throughout the world is standing, a symbol of the resurrection. So what does that mean? So we stand and sing the communion song together. Suppose I'm in the first row, I receive first, I come back for communion, and I continue to stand and sing the communion song together with the rest of the assembly. We wait for each other. I don't shatter the body of Christ by demanding my private prayer time now. I don't shatter, scatter the body. I continue to stand and continue to pray and sing because of the theology of common posture. By the way, one of the interesting points in this document is that the communion song begins when the priest communicates. So as soon as the consecrated host is consumed by the priest, we start to sing. And it continues, the song continues until the last person receives. So that's where we see the important teaching that we wait for each other. We wait until all have received. One of the other wonderful gifts of the general instruction to the Roman Missal is that it will tell us the purpose of the various rites of the Mass. It will also tell us the purpose, for example, of the communion song. So what kind of communion song do you sing? It says the purpose of the communion song is to express the communicants' union of spirit by means of the unity of their voices. So obviously, this is going to be something that they already know by heart. They don't need a book for. It might just be a refrain that they can sing by heart. Come and be filled here at this table, food for all who hunger and drink for all who thirst. So union of spirit by means of the union of our voices to show joy of heart and to highlight more clearly the communitarian nature of the procession to receive communion. So great opportunity for musicians or those who choose music. Okay, if this is what the church says is the purpose of the song, how is that fitting with your parish program? And then the document says, then we sit with the priest or we may kneel during the silence that happens when communion is finished. So in order to enter deeply into the time of profound silence, the time of adoration and thanksgiving, this beautiful opportunity for personal prayer, but together with the whole body, everybody sits, everyone is silent, everyone enters into adoration, everyone enters into thanksgiving for an extended time. Now, I would suggest the only way this will work is if two things are already in place. One is the habit of the assembly to sing and love to sing during communion. Because if people really don't have that experience, they're gonna look around and say, how come I'm still standing? What am I doing standing here? But if we are singing and praying and praising together with the communion song, then it's gonna make a lot of sense as we wait for each other. The second thing that I would suggest is necessary, again, to make these articles work, is if the bishop or the priest ensures that time of extended silence after communion. Because otherwise, people will, once they've received, immediately kneel or sit and begin their time of private prayer if the Mass itself doesn't guarantee I mean, I will wait for you if I know that my time of private prayer, our time of private prayer is coming. So you'll find those articles there in germ, um, and I know they work. Um, it's a very profound experience when the entire assembly waits for each other 
sings and prays and waits for each other. And then together with the priest, the entire assembly sits and a time of extended prayer begins. It's worth catechesis. It's worth that practice. Maybe start with 20 seconds, you know, and tell people this is what's happening and this is what you can do with the 20 seconds. Maybe in the course of a year, you can move it to 30 seconds, maybe eventually to 45 seconds. So that's one of the articles in there. Note also, too, that a hymn after communion is optional. But note that if you decide to sing something after communion, the whole assembly sings it. There is no such thing in the Roman Catholic rite, something called a communion meditation. You won't find that. And it's also interesting what you won't find in germ is a closing song. Is a closing song that the assembly sings. That doesn't mean don't do that, but just know that you have options. Maybe the choir could sing it. If you have a terrific organist like Elaine, she can just play. So there's a variety of things that you can do to be pastorally effective. Number five, silence. Here's the document where you will find silence after the penitential rite, after let us pray, after the readings, after the homily, and certainly after communion. And I would suggest this is a wonderful opportunity to catechize so the Catholics really have a strong sense of, what am I doing during this quiet time? Did the cantor forget to get up? What's, what's going on? So to catechize people so that they will be able to enter deeply into that dialogue with the Holy Spirit. Number six, I put this in here not so much because it's practical, because I'm not sure it is, but I love the theology. There is strong encouragement, again, from 1970, encouragement for the assembly to receive communion from this mass, from this sacrifice. Why do I love that theology? Because the priest, as part of his priesthood, must receive communion from this sacrifice. Vatican II says, but we are also priestly people. We are encouraged to receive the body and blood of Christ from this sacrifice, not from the tabernacle. So I I think that's a beautiful theology to to reflect on. Again, it may not be all that practical, um, but the theology, I think, is profound. We have just offered this sacrifice together, and so we receive from this table. And of course, there will be emergencies And of course, you'll need to go to the tabernacle upon occasion. No problem with that. But notice that the general instruction to the Roman Missal doesn't say anything about, and here's where you go to the tabernacle after the Lamb of God. No such thing. There is provision for going afterwards with hosts that are remaining. So prepare enough bread and wine for all the communicants. Number seven, communion under both kinds. Article 281 will remind us, in communion under both kinds, the sign of the Eucharistic banquet is more clearly evident and clear expression is given to the divine will by which the new and eternal covenant is ratified in the blood of the Lord. So strong, again, this is 1970. Um, I think our people could continue to use some powerful catechesis about the meaning of receiving the precious blood. Number eight, the importance of singing. During the entrance, um, again, Germ will tell you what's the purpose of the entrance song. Yes, it is to get the ministers down the aisle, but that's only one of four purposes. An even more important purpose is to foster the unity of all those who have gathered. So if this is fostering unity, this is probably going to be a song that we know and love to sing. The psalm, of course, the communion song, etc. And again, all of that being said, Article 387, the diocesan bishop, who is to be regarded as the high priest of his flock, must promote, regulate, and be vigilant over the liturgical life in his diocese. So some rubrics here um, will be appropriately altered by the judgment of the diocesan bishop. 
And then just quickly, some changes. So germ from 2002 saw itself as adding a few new things, very few, stressing even more some good liturgical practices, making some restrictions, clarifying rubrics that they didn't clarify in the beginning, making explicit what should happen, permitting some new options. And these will be common to you. The assembly sings at every Sunday and feast day mass. There is no silent early Sunday morning mass that does not exist in the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, the assembly, I didn't mention this, this is number 45. The assembly will enjoy some silence before mass begins. The rite of blessing and sprinkling with holy water encouraged especially during the Easter season. Catholics know that the absolution prayer during the penitential rite is, and I should say not, there's a T missing, is not sacramental. You know, this is not the sacrament of confession. Communion is received standing. And here's where we have this new action. There is a bow of the head as a gesture of reverence before receiving communion. But just note, I'm just going to say this to you. Just be aware of this. You don't need to change anything. What the document actually calls for is you come up to the communion minister who says to you, the body of Christ, then you bow your head and you receive. Many people really love to do a profound bow from the waist to the back of the person in front of them before they actually go up. Now, I would say don't, you know, this is not an important liturgical rubric, but just know that the document says it's after you are presented with the precious body or the precious blood, and it's a head bow, and then you receive. Um, and I wanted to mention this too. There's a whole chapter about how you celebrate mass with the presence of the deacon. It is the deacon who carries the book of the gospels in the entrance procession. That's article 172. And it's the deacon himself who normally announces the general intercessions. That's number 177. Here's where we have the communion ministers who approach the altar after the priest receives communion. This is not the same thing as approaching the sanctuary. You can come into the sanctuary much earlier. You just come to the altar after the priest receives communion. And the ministers receive the vessels from the priest or deacon. Here's where we have the practice of lectors carrying the gospel book, encouragement to have several lectors, and again, the encouragement not to have any kind of haste in the proclamation of the word. Let those silences, let the psalm really sink in. And then finally, just a couple of other notes. This beautiful one in 320, 321, that the bread and the wine should have the appearance of food. Whatever that means to you and your parish. The altar cross should have a figure of Christ on it. Now note, this is not the processional cross. Unless you use the processional cross as the altar cross. Um, in our cathedral, we have a gorgeous, gigantic crucifix on the wall. So our processional cross could be quite plain. It's, if you're using it as the altar cross, it has a corpus. And then this wonderful line, number 38, consideration should also be given to the idiom of different languages and the culture of different pe peoples. So thank you for your patience. I hope this will just kick off some thoughts about, again, not, not using the liturgical law in this book as anything other than an inspiring, helpful pastoral tool to look at the theology of the body of Christ and how we might deepen our experience of the Eucharist in our parish. Thanks very much. Over to you, Rick. Thank you very much, Sister Sharon. Um, hopefully at each of your sites, you have uh, copies of Sister Sharon's outline Monday. Terry Burroughs, are you there? I'm here, and Jim here. is our, is our uh, person. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We need to make sure that every other site other than Arroyo Grande is muted. I think 
Andres, I think you might still be on, and we're getting feedback. Now you're off. Now you're back on. There you go. Okay, good. Andres, now you're off. Perfect. Okay, Jim, you're on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we found that the, the germ is a wonderful um, source to keep us on track with these things, but we realized that in the joy of knowing what we do, um, we want to share that joy. So a lot of what we talked about is how are we going to teach others um, to, to know these things? We talked about uh, bowing of the head and little details that, that really enhance um, the unity that we want to strive for. And so we talked a bit about how we're going to find ways to, to teach that. Um, and challenges, one of the greatest challenges, which kind of spills into the second question, is um, the great vision of not going to the tabernacle um, for communicating at that mass. We really would like to work on that, but it, we're really worried that it's very difficult at times. And so it's something that we are going to, we talked a lot about and have concerns with. So into the second question about um, what we'd like to do, we, we agreed that that would be a great vision, but there's a real struggle as to how can we stop from having the tabernacle so full of hosts that we only consecrate a few at a mass to, so that we can finish what's there and, and trying to find ways to really balance that. Um, and just again, to, that we're looking for ways that we would like to encourage to find ways to teach people uh, the beauty of, the, of bowing, the common postures of of um, sitting, standing, so that everyone's doing the same thing. Um, but knowing that one way that we need to do that, for example, during the commune rite, is to also build up our spaces of silence to allow um, allow room for that to happen. And then the last point was, um, which may become a question later, is that it was implied in Sister's presentation that, that the hymn we're singing during communion is one single song, since it covers a single action. And we know that the practice is often as you finish the song and move on to another, maybe even a third. And we would like to encourage the music ministries to do one song and find one that all can sing while we're, we're, we're uh, walking in the communion. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Jim. Um, how about we go to Pastor Robles? Deacon Hi, Ed? Ray. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear uh, you nice and clearly. Okay, great. So we had, uh, on, with regard to question one, elements where we found surprising. Uh, many of us had no idea that there was no such thing as a meditation song, where we would all sit silently listening to a song sung while we were not singing. Um, we would like to, we were sort of surprised many by the fact that silence was called for at many parts of the Mass, and we really don't see that implemented very effectively at times. Some found it very surprising um, about the standing um, only while communion is being preferred, and that's how we're directed. Um, some were surprised about the bishop having authority to um, override what's in the germ, and secondarily, if that in fact is his um, prerogative that we should be catechized that it is in fact his uh, prerogative to change things and then have a consistent implementation of things the way the bishop likes to have them done throughout the diocese. Many of us were very surprised that there's no sending forth song. I think a lot of us have gone forth singing a song for a very long time. And we were also very surprised, as Jim said, about the tabernacle host. That's become such a part of our uh, tradition here and many other places where we are constantly bringing out quite a number of hosts from a previous sacrifice. Um, what would we like to see implemented better? Um, better use of silence after each reading, perhaps after the responsorial psalm, after the homily, after communion, um, and allowing there perhaps to be a prolonged time after the communion song is sung, during which people can then have silent prayer individually, their own, uh, in, the own in the way that they prefer to do it. Um, and some would like to see the song being sung immediately after the priest communicates. Um, apparently, in a lot of places, they wait a bit to start singing. So they'd like to implement that more effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Ed. Uh, how about we go to Spreckles? Nikki at St. Joseph's? Yeah. 
Can you see us? Can you hear us? We can. We can. We can see you and hear you loud and clear. <laughs> okay. So okay. Yara is going to speak for Spreckles tonight. Very good. Thank we, you. Those of us present here in Spreckles have kind of mentioned some of the things that have been um, said already. So I'll try to go quickly through some of these. Um, some of the elements um, that we found surprising or helpful or challenging, same things that have been brought up about the silence after communion, and also silence before the mass. Um, at some of the parishes, the, the choir's practicing, there's other things going on before the mass. Also, uh, um, the going to the tabernacle before communion, that was something else that was kind of surprising to us. Also, the optional of having the closing hymn. Um, in some parishes, we find out that they have the closing hymn, and then everybody's applauding. Um, and then also, um, still struggling, we feel, in a lot of the parishes with some of the previous changes, getting some of the parishioners still to accept them. And um, also kind of surprising about having the ministers and everybody singing when they process in. Some of the things that we'd like to um, see implemented are having silence after communion, um, also finding a way to find a leader to actually be in charge of parishes to lead the sheep, as it was said, to um, bring about some of these um, changes. And also um, what we find challenging was about the bowing at communion, where people are bowing behind the person who's receiving communion and how do we kind of avoid that. We kind of feel like the same thing that we might see a, a letter come from the bishop to our pastors on what we really do need to implement and that we really need the support of our priests and our parishes to help us implement those changes. That's it. Excellent, well said and, and concisely said, we appreciate that. Um, let's go to Aptos, Resurrection, Deacon Patrick, Sister Barbara. Hello. So uh, I think that um, the things that we talked about, we were chuckling because they've all been said. Apparently, we're all having the same conversation around the diocese. So uh, I won't repeat all that, just ditto. Uh, certainly, the things that we find challenging to implement are the times of silences, um, the, uh, again, the, the bow has been something that's been misunderstood, you know, the profound bow versus the simple bow of the head. Um, these are things that we feel like we want to work on uh, in our parishes. We three or four different parishes here. Uh, the, the suggestion that I have about the uh, going to the tabernacle uh, is that it may be necessary most of the time to go to the tabernacle, but how and when you do it can make all the difference that you convey to the people that they are receiving from this sacrifice. Then at some point after the distribution of communion has been done, an acolyte or someone else could discreetly go to the tabernacle to supply the plates as needed. But at least the symbolic value of receiving from the one table can still be honored if it can't always be honored in a in a literal way because if you run out of host. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Deacon Patrick. Um, let's move to Monterey. It looks like Deacon Andres is going to speak there. So, uh, ditto to everything, but it's the, still the, a very surprising element is that not all these very lovely and deeply theological uh, elements of uh, liturgy have been implemented. That's the most surprising thing, I would say. And, um, and, and perhaps the way to address them uh, pretty much at once is again from an instruction from our bishop, uh, um, having or inviting the, the parishes to have an element of catechism during mass. Um, uh, a comment, uh, the, the germ, as we, as we pointed out, um, has a, 
a character, there's a character in the journal which is called the commentator. That could, the role of the commentator could be just that, uh, bring uh, an element of catechism during, during the liturgy, perhaps at the time of announcements, uh, perhaps at the beginning of mass, um, maybe uh, right at the end of the homily or in, in, including the homily. So that's uh, something that we have talked about before when Bishop gave his presentation, and maybe we should continue talking about this important aspect of, of uh, catechizing. Thank you, Deacon Andres. Um, I believe the only other um, site that I need to check in with is Hollister, but I think Hollister actually may have checked out. Um, they were having their parish mission tonight, and I know that Jean Marie said they might be leaving early, but as many of you know, I have forgotten Jean Marie from time to time, and I don't want to be accused of doing that again. So let me just make sure. Jean Marie, are you out there? Okay, I'm going to take that as a, as a fact that they've all gone to their parish, uh, to their parish mission. Um, so I'll report for Nativity, and I will just say ditto to everything that everyone said, but I would like to underscore that we had a lot of discussion about unity of posture. Uh, we had a lot of discussion regarding the need for catechesis. Um, Andres, I really liked what you had to say. Um, and I think there are creative ways um, that we can implement some catechesis, even in the context of our homilies, um, brief pieces of catechesis that can be inserted when we're talking about different things in our homilies. Um, and then we had a lot of discussion, too, about silence and the importance of silence. And uh, Sister talked about building up to 45 seconds of silence, and many people here felt like 45 seconds was just scratching the surface, that we needed to teach the people to have minutes of silence. Um, so that's sort of the, the things that we underscored, but everything really was pretty much the same. I agree with Deacon Patrick, who said it sounds like the conversation in the diocese is all pretty much the same. I wonder, um, Sister Sharon, if you might have any, any comments in response to what you've been hearing um, as far as comments from the people around the diocese. I do, Rick, and I, I would uh, love to have the chance to maybe comment on some of those uh, delightful points that I heard. Um, maybe, maybe just to reiterate a context that the general instruction of the Roman Missal is liturgical law of the Roman Catholic Church for every parish throughout the world. Now, that being said, I think it's important for all of us who work in liturgy to read it, to know it, but then make our pastoral decisions based on what is good for our people. You know, for example, if you decide for the season of Advent, you want to sing a communion meditation song. Well, it doesn't exist, but you know why it doesn't exist. You know the point of that. But you decide for your community for this season, this is what we're going to go ahead and do. So that this is a tool that I think empowers all of us. It's not meant to be a burden. And again, certainly it's not meant to be something that we hit each other over the head with. Um, certainly my intention tonight is not to burden people with, you know, 72 new details that they weren't doing in their masses, and all of a sudden by next weekend you've got to change. I would, I would make this more inviting. This is a beautiful tool because it has the theology of the Second Vatican Council. You know, take a year and read one part of it and delve deeply into it. Let the liturgy committee um, ruminate on some of this. Let the musicians look at the musical part. Let the lectors look at the part on the liturgy of the word. You know, and just really take your time and see what fits your people and how you might implement this. Um, you know, for example, I am, I'm not sure that you know, if I were the pastor of San Carlos, I think the first thing I would do is not try to change that profound bow before communion. 
I don't know how Catholics learned it. There are an awful lot of people for whom that is deeply moving and deeply prayerful. I, I would move to the silence before uh, mass starts, um, the silence after the reading. I would do something else. But go ahead and, and decide what really would make sense for your own community. You know, for example, I would pick just one thing. You know, okay, how would we have silence before the beginning of Mass? San Carlos, this would actually be really easy, I think. Uh, many of you who may know our beautiful cathedral know that our bells are manual, so that we are sure somebody's ringing those bells at least by 10 minutes before Mass. Then the cantor does her rehearsal, his rehearsal, and all of that time is guaranteed for the musicians. And then, perhaps 30 seconds before Mass, we ring a bell, we have a musical note, we have some kind of very strong cue that says, business is over, prayer is beginning, and there's now 30 seconds before the opening song. Again, the musicians, I think, could very easily give us that cue and provide that time. Or something else that you may want to choose. Again, I would just suggest choose one thing that you think would have the most helpful impact in terms of the prayer life of your assembly. Maybe you want to focus on those silences after the readings. And, you know, and maybe if your priest is willing, you know, say for the first four months, have the priest say, we're going to take 30 seconds now and let the Holy Spirit begin a dialogue in our hearts with what we've just heard. Because you know how often it is people really aren't sure why is there this silence and what am I supposed to be doing? So let's provide that that catechesis and that invitation to let that prayer happen. The silence after communion, I would really suggest to you, is tremendously worth doing. We began it several months ago in San Carlos. It certainly isn't perfect, but the image of the entire assembly standing, singing the communion song, waiting for one another, and then when the priest gestures, everyone sitting, and the extended silence begins. And one of our priests does compliment the assembly on how profound and extended and beautiful that time of adoration and thanksgiving is. You know, maybe just do that. In some places, I dare to say a church perhaps close to here could also spend some time catechizing on people waiting until Mass is over before they leave. You know, one of the most important words is that of the deacon. Go. The Mass has ended. And we stay until he missions us to go out and live what we have received. And not, we don't decide, we're finished and we're leaving now. You know, if we took a year and got everybody to actually stay to the end of Mass, imagine what, what that might mean. I would also like to see extended catechesis on the necessity of receiving the precious blood and what that means when Jesus says, take and drink, and how could we facilitate the understanding and the pastoral practice of that. And you suggested, Rick, that I might have a, another suggestion of how some of this might happen. In the Diocese of San Jose, some of the parishes have implemented what they call four minutes. And it works like this. It's the four minutes after the prayer, after communion. The topic is decided by the people of the parish. They decide we would like to hear about this, we would like to hear about this, whatever it is that they would really like to hear their priests talk about. It's done in a sequence of maybe four Sundays in a row, maybe six Sundays in a row, maybe more. It's one text. It is communicated by every priest that celebrates the Mass. And one of the best parts is they ask a member of the assembly, after four minutes, no matter what, 
raise your hand, and the priest stops. And the priests in San Jose report the most amazing thing has happened. Nobody leaves early. (laughs) Can you imagine? Nobody leaves early. Because they want to stay. They want the catechesis. So again, this is something called four minutes, and I'm sure it's implemented in many other places too, but it's a great kind of... Um, you know, easily understood, easily organized catechetical piece along with what Bishop Andres was saying about the commentator. In this case, the commentator would be the presider. Um, But an easy way to say, you know, whatever it is that the people want to hear about. It doesn't need to be the priest's agenda. The people want to hear you know, the history of Unipero Serra in this era. I mean, whatever it is that the people really want to say, here's our topic, and then the priests implement it as a strictly catechetical tool. I've I've found that it's been um, very successful. So, thank you. Thank you again, Sister. Um, Before we conclude tonight, Sister Barbara, I know you're up in Aptos. Um, Sister Barbara is the Director of the Office of Worship, and it's under her guidance that we put these workshops together, and Sister Barbara, I'd like to give you a minute or two to say a few words. I know you would particularly like to thank everyone, but if there's anything else you'd like to share with us. I certainly would. Uh, thank. I would like to thank everyone, and especially Sister Sharon, and I agree with you. It was a, indeed a great blessing that she came to our uh, I would like to say that we are in the process of trying to, and have been for some time, trying to develop some guidelines that would be helpful for parishes in implementing some of these things. Uh, Our difficulty when we do this is disseminating them and helping people to latch on to what might be done in an individual parish. So I'm thinking that perhaps one of the things we might do in the future is just to have some of these little presentations on a particular aspect of of the germ. For example, uh, particularly dealing with the communion rite and the communion procession and giving some practical suggestions. So if you think that's a good idea, folks out there, let us know. And because we are looking at topics for future video sessions, and if that would be something helpful, we would love to do that. So thank you again, and thank you, Deacon Rick, for all you've done to help put this together. It's marvelous. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Sister Barbara. Uh, Deacon Andres, are you still there? If you are, can you come back up to the podium, please? Since since Sister Sharon elevated you to bishop. um, Cardinal, uh, cardinal. Cardinal. Well, she said... A moment ago, she said Bishop Andres. And yeah, so but I, I corrected that her. Be... I say Cardinal. <laughs> well, I, I'm going, since you're the Cardinal Andres, I wonder, and also certainly, as, as I look around the diocese, you are the senior deacon among us tonight. I thought perhaps you could close us in prayer, give us your blessing, and send us on a mission. Sure. So again, we gather in the presence of our, our most gracious Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have heard words of wisdom from Sister Sharon today, and we are energized to bring this to our communities, to start the conversation, to bring the catechism right outside the Mass, as we gather before the Mass, as we greet people. There are plenty of opportunities to bring this mission of being one people, one body, one presence, one parish, one diocese. Let us go forth and complete this mission. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Andres, if we could have your blessing, please. Oh, and we do this. Do you want the Trinitarian blessing? Or? <laughs> Well, well, since we are the Roman Catholic Church, I think that would be appropriate. Thank you. (laughs) And we do this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 (laughs) Go in peace, everyone. Prepare the way of the Lord.